Okay, so our next presentation is from Bethlehem University, right? Thank you. Um, looks like it maybe had some issues translating over, but hopefully all the stuff will work. Uh, I'm Joanna Egan. I'm with Bethlehem University, and I worked on stroboscopic and imaging of edge tones and resonators. Uh, so bring that up. Okay. Um, so the basis of this research is the edge tone phenomenon. This occurs when an airstream is blown through a slit over an edge. So you can see this slit right here is going over a completely just suspended in midair edge. Um, when the airstream meets the edge, there is going to be pressure feedback, depending on whether it's above or below it, and vortices are going to peel off of it back onto the original airstream. This pushes it towards the opposite side of the edge, and you get a perpetual motion that turns into an oscillation. And this produces the frequency that is called the edge tone. This frequency has its own natural frequencies and harmonics that correspond to the airstream velocity, as well as the distance between the slit and the edge. When you pair an edge tone, a free edge, with an air column, as you can see in this picture, the original free floating edge has now been paired with a column that will go on in length. That edge tone's natural frequencies lock into the natural frequencies of the column dependent on its length. So the overarching goal of my research was to get not only real-time images of the natural frequencies of a free edge, but also this frequency locking that occurs when you add a column. In order to do this, we use something called Schlieren imaging. Um, this is an optical technique used to image uh, non-uniform flows of non-uniform density. Um, this is something like if your flow is mixing with something of a different temperature or a different chemical density. This is accomplished by reflecting a light source with, in this case, I have a mirror, it could be a lens, um, off to a focal point and creating an imaging region where the mixing and the non-uniform density would be. And then at the focal point of the reflected image, you cut it off by about 50%. That's a bit of a situational. Um, okay. yeah. um, that's kind of dependent on the situation. You can adjust it depending on how good of an image you're getting. But by cutting off about 50% of the focal point, what happens in the imaging region changes what makes it past the focal point to whatever you're using to look at what's happening in there. So a camera, a, um, a viewing screen. And so what you get is an image of the flow associated with those chips. For example, if you put a candle in there and you lit it, what you would see on your viewing screen or camera would be the heating of the air that's occurring around the flame. In order to use this with edge tones, we use a slightly different setup than the basic one that I showed you just there. Um, what happens here is you have a light source that is reflected directly back onto itself with the mirror, with the imaging region occurring directly in that line. And then right in front of the light source, I have a beam splitter at a 45 degree angle, um, which sends a duplicate focal point 90 degrees to the right. And then that's where my knife edge was. And we had a Sony Alpha 7 3 camera position right behind it. So a digital camera. Um, you can see the actual setup here. Uh, this We chose this setup because, as you can see, you have your light source right here, and you have the beam sweater right here and the knife edge right here, all on a compact optics board. Um, a secondary goal of our Schlieren imaging was to produce a compact, movable, demonstrable Schlieren system that we could use for university demonstration purposes. Um, additionally, because of optics properties, sometimes with Schlieren and you have when you have overlapping reflection areas and focal points at different angles, you can end up with things like double images, um, apparition, apparitions. Um, and so this system, because the focal point is at a 90 degree angle duplicated, it does not interact at all with the imaging region. So you don't end up with a distorted image. Um, so we had to use an extra method as well to actually look at edge tones with Schlieren imaging, and this was the stroboscopic method. This is because when there are oscillations over the edge, they are occurring too quickly for the camera to actually keep up with in real time effectively, or at least the camera that we were using. Um, so in order to help with this, we strobe the laser because the stroboscopic method introduces a, 
another frequency occurring at the same time that is going to, for the camera, create a suspended image of each frame that's happening. So what the camera is seeing by strobing the laser and having it at the same frequency as the oscillation is going over the edge, you're getting a, a almost stop motion image of what's happening over the edge. And then the, um, because ideally these would be at the exact same frequency and you would get a really clear image. However, because there are uncertainties in both how you can measure the frequency and how the strobing is going to be effective in, in tuning into that frequency, um, you have to under, we had to make sure that we were accounting for the beat frequency and looking at what is, is there a difference between those frequencies as we're measuring them. And that value would kind of show us how, how well that strobing was going to be in showing us a clear image. Um, and the equation for that is just the frequency that we're measuring in real time going over the edge and the frequency of our strobing. We accomplished this by using a function generator connected to the LED driver that was driving the fiber optics cable with the laser um, at a 50% duty cycle. This uh, allowed us to set the LED to strobe at, a, at the measured frequency that we were getting. We measured the frequency by using the iPhone app decibel X. Um, this provided real-time frequency by just opening the app and holding it next to the edge tone as, it, as air was being blown over it. Um, and it would give us a range of the frequency that was happening there. This was the most uncertain part of this whole experiment. And so what we had to do was take about a 10 second sample for each flute to see what are the fluctuations that are actually occurring while we're taking that frequency. What is the range that it's falling in? Um, so we have 10 seconds of samples for each flute. Um, and once again, just the closer that these are, the better the image will, that we'll get. So we really wanted to get zeroed in on a small uncertainty for both of these. Um, so we actually had to have something to uh, use an edge for. So we wanted to create not just a free edge, but also edges with air columns. And so we modeled them after wooden flutes. I don't know if any of you use like small wooden train flutes when you were kids or anything, but this is what that would look like on the inside if you cut off the sides. So we created a 3D printed model here where you have your mixing chamber up here and then your slit and your edge. And then we had a couple of different lengths of resonating columns. And then down here is a file of, that we used to laser cut acrylic windows that would fit onto the side. And we etched um, adhering surface, uh, we etched into it the size and length of the 3D printed model so that they could be glued on and there would be an adhering surface. So they would actually be sealed flutes, working flutes that produced a tone. Here are the final results of what we ended up making. You can see over here, we've got the um, free edge where it's just, a wedge suspended in front of a mixing chamber. The mixing chamber is still encompassed by acrylic, but there isn't going to be much you're going to see happening in there. Um, for the free edge, we had the distance between the edge and the chamber to be 3.9 millimeters. And then to the right here, or yeah, you're right. Um, we have the 20 centimeter flute, I believe. Um, and you can see how we've got the full body of it 3D printed and then acrylic windows along the sides so that is it's a transparent flute. We also brought the edges of the acrylic kind of above the flute, so you can't actually hold it it's like you would a train whistle. But this was because when it's closer to where the actual edge is, it's hard to get a clear image because you have uh, your light going parallel through to achieve the Schlieren imaging. But when you have the sharp edge, when you have the cut acrylic edge, it diffracts the light a little bit and distorts the image. So now that we had something to actually put the flow through, we needed to figure out what flow we were going to use. Um, we had two options to induce, induce the density shifts that the Schlieren would see. One was by changing the temperature of what was going through the flute from the room of temperature air around it. And the other was to just use something that was at a different chemical density. We ended up going the chemical route by using um, sulfur hexafluoride. This is a chemical that's five times heavier than room temperature air. So it produces a really sharp image because inherently by introducing it into a Schlieren image, it has a really huge density shift. Um, so, it also, in the end, was the most efficient and simple system for an experiment that is mostly looking at just imaging. So you can see here, we've just got a tank with a hose going into the flute, and that was all for that. So we had a Schlieren imaging system that we was effective for edge stones. We had transparent edges that we could actually image, um, a flow system that was efficient and simple, and a flow medium that would show up really well in Schlieren imaging. So we could actually do the imaging now. 
For each foot, we took, we recorded the measured frequency through decibel X. We took the stroke frequency of the function generator. And we also recorded 30 seconds for each flute of the um, edge of the flow over the edge. And I picked out three frames from each of those videos to show the active oscillation. So I have a video here. Oh, is it going to work? It might not. Oh, my. Get back to our own time. So picking out three frames from that um, with the little red arrows showing kind of what you should be seeing in there. Um, there is a dip in the oscillations right here and then it evens out where you don't see anything going on and you can see it pushing it back towards the top. This one, if you're not seeing anything in this one, this one was the hardest to pick out. It has the highest frequency because it's the free edge and I'll talk more about that later. Um, and then we've got the 10 centimeter flute. So I'm not going to work. Um, sorry, this is very clunky, but uh, so three frames from this one, you can actually see the word vortices in this one. So you see in this first frame, the vortex is forming down below the edge. This is the pressure feedback peeling it off. And then in the middle one, it is, it is now re-met the original airstream. It's pushing it back up and you see a second one on the top building. And then in this third frame, you see that one that's now appeared in the top peeling off and it will rejoin the airstream. You can see further down off the edge for vortices uh, dissipating into the air. And then we have the final one. Um, I'm so sorry about the video, it's not working. It's very clunky. Okay, that one's going to need access. We'll just look at the frames for this one, but it looks very similar to the 10 centimeter, it just has a lower frequency. But you have a really well formed vortex right here that then peels back. In into the airstream, you can see it colliding right here and pushing it down. You can see a new one forming here, and then this one coming in on the bottom to push it back up. And you have the old one dissipating up here. So in terms of the frequency analysis of the frequencies that we measured and the strobing frequency, um, you can see that the free edge was the highest. So it's in a really high side of the audible frequency range. Um, it had the highest uncertainty as well, which kind of points towards the idea that it was the hardest to see. Um, its strobing frequency was set at 8,182 um, 8, hertz with a beat frequency in the end of 13, including that uncertainty. So it was a difficult one to tune those into. Um, but then you can see really visibly when you move into the ones that have the resonating chambers, the 10 centimeter and the 20 centimeter, the frequency drops significantly. It drops into a much more audible tone. And you can see that even though you still have the edge going on, it no longer has its own natural frequency. It now possesses the frequency of the air column. Um, and the beat frequencies were below 10 for that one. So we were pretty happy with how well those two did. Um, overall, we achieved real-time images of the edge tones. Um, we also observed the natural frequency locking. Uh, additionally, we constructed a system for Schlieren imaging that is good for the department to show um, fluid and acoustic properties regularly in demonstrations. Um, in terms of next steps for this project, if someone were to pick it up after me, um, I would definitely improve the design of the flutes. As you could kind of hear in the videos, it's a it, it was a fuzzy tone. It wasn't super clear. So I think there would be better ways to construct the flutes to be um, transparent and yet still sealed to the point where they're an actual um, resonating flute. I also would love to do some more of the numerical work. There's a lot of relations to fluid mechanics in, in fluid mechanics to the harmonic side of things. And I think um, evaluating the numerical data against the images would be a cool corroboration of the um, not just natural frequencies of edge tones, but also the frequency blocking. That is all I have for you. No one has any questions. Yep. Burning questions, otherwise I'd have one. He's got a burning question. Go ahead. So do you put your cell phone in, you sweep the frequency until you hear sound, like being amplified inside, or 
Um, so the idea is that as soon as you start the flow and the flow starts going through the fluid or over the free edge, you're going to hear something. So it was more just as soon as we had a consistent flow going through it, we could pull the phone right next to it and it would have, um, it would read a consistent frequency. Oh, so the phone was a microphone. Yes, yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought it was like- Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, yeah. It was because, a Because, yeah, like confusion. So I thought you were finding the frequency using a, a speaker. Oh, uh, gotcha. Because yeah. the speed of sound changes air to mm -hmm. the like, yeah, yes, yeah, and the yeah. frequency didn't change. So mm -hmm. I, I got you. Yep, yeah. Sorry, that was confusing. Yeah. So I have a daughter. She plays a flute. Doesn't look like that, and it has holes in it. On the yeah. other hand, this thing is adjustable. Mm -hmm. Could you build one with a piston so you could actually Absolutely. change it? Yeah, you could definitely. Um, because of the fact that the natural frequency is locked into the frequency of the air column, anything you can do to change an air column's frequency, such as putting holes in it, putting a piston, you can do all of that to an edge tone frequency. So an organ pipe is a huge example of an application of the edge tone frequency. Okay. Well, we better get on to our next speaker, but thanks again. Thank you.